It's an anxious and difficult time for Americans all across the nation. More than 50, 57,000 lives lost. More than 26 million Americans have filed for unemployment. We're all worried about our health and our families. And women are experiencing much of the pandemic devastating impacts more than anything else. Millions of women have lost their jobs or had their hours slashed and are facing worries about just making ends meet. And millions more of women are uh, on the front lines as healthcare workers, doctors, nurses, sanitation workers, childcare workers, grocery store clerks, workers and more and more are carrying on their backs the rest of the nation. Domestic violence survivors are at a heightened risk, forced to shelter in place with their abusers. Women's access to reproductive health care is increasingly in jeopardy. And while this virus can hit anyone, anywhere, regardless of race, gender, economic status, or level of power, it doesn't impact every community equally. It hits hard as those who are most vulnerable and who have the fewest resources, including women of color and low-income women. This pandemic is pulling back the curtain on so many inequities in our society. The lack of paid sick leave for workers, the need for a livable minimum wage, the need for stronger unemployment insurance. We're going to dig into all these issues and more in today's discussion, and I'm really thrilled to have my friend, the former senator and former secretary of state and the woman who should be president of the United States right now, Hillary Clinton. Welcome, Hillary. It's great to have you here. Thank you so much, Joe. It's a real pleasure to be here with you and to be part of this very important discussion. And I am thrilled uh, to be part of your campaign to not only endorse you, but to help highlight a lot of the issues that are at stake uh, in this presidential election. As you just so rightly said, uh, this terrible pandemic that we're all going through hits a lot of Americans much harder than others. Uh, we've seen it firsthand in hospitalizations and in, unfortunately, uh, fatalities. But we've also seen it when we look uh, at the pictures uh, of those people on the front lines. Do you know 80% of all healthcare workers in America are women? And one out of three jobs held by women in our country has been classified as essential. So this is an issue that affects all of us, uh, young and old, every kind of background from every walk of life. But it is having a disproportionate impact on the front lines, on women working, on women caring for others, on women holding down uh, the home uh, as we go through this together. So I want to add my voice to the many who have endorsed you uh, to be our president. Just think of what a difference it would make right now if we had a president who not only listened to the science, put facts over fiction, but brought us together, showed the kind of compassion and caring that we need from our president and which Joe Biden has been exemplifying throughout his entire life. Think of what it would mean if we had a real president, not just somebody who plays one on TV, but somebody who gets up every morning worried about the people that he's responsible for leading during this crisis. Well, I know what a difference it would make because I've been there. I've seen firsthand what presidents can and should do. And I, like so many Americans, really wish that we had that kind of leadership now. You know, Joe Biden has been preparing for uh, this moment his entire life. I've been privileged to work with him uh, over the last uh, 25 plus years uh, as first lady, then for eight years in the Senate where I watched him build coalitions and work uh, to bring people together to solve problems. Then during the Obama administration, when I was privileged to be Secretary of State, I've been in the Situation Room uh, with Joe as we debated. And you know, where we didn't say what we thought people wanted to hear, we said what we believed. And we had a president then with President Obama who encouraged that, think of it, <laughs> who wanted to hear uh, from each and every one of us. 
I've been in the you know lobby of the Senate. I've been in the cloakroom, and I've watched Joe bring people together. So for me, this is uh, a moment that we need a leader, a president like Joe Biden. I also know a lot about Joe the person. Um, I've seen him up close and personal now for many years. Uh, we have a lot of the same values in common, the same work ethic, the same belief in America, the same you know, focus on family. And we share uh, a common experience and a love of Scranton, Pennsylvania. <laughs> When my uh, great-grandparents uh, came from England and Wales, uh, they ended up in Scranton. And my grandfather and then my father grew up in a house on Diamond Avenue. And while the Rodhams were living on Diamond Avenue, the Bidens were over on North Washington Street. <laughs> and, you know, I've had uh, a lot of... Uh, time to uh, visit Scranton, talk about Scranton uh, with Joe. And one memorable occasion, uh, we were there together and he said, hey, uh, let's go see the house that I lived in when I was uh, a little boy. And if you know Joe Biden, you know the words were out of his mouth and we were racing uh, to get there. And of course we got there and he talked his way in. It wasn't hard because uh, the woman who was at home immediately recognized him and knew him. And then we went through the house with Joe regaling me with these great stories uh, about his dad, Joe Sr., and his mom, Jean, and the neighborhood. He, he was pointing out the window, telling me who lived where when he was growing up. He told me one story that I loved. He, he said he was getting ready to go to a junior high school dance, and um, he didn't have any cufflinks. And so his very creative mother, uh, Jean, got him a nut and bolt and uh, made a pair of cufflinks for him. But I think he said he was mortified by that, and he told her that, and she just looked at him and she said, Joey, if somebody says something to you about your cufflinks, you just say, what, you don't have a pair like that? It was that kind of love of family, that unconditional support uh, that led Joe to be the extraordinary family member and father that he's been through all the tragedy that so many of us have followed um, from afar, but no, how deeply he connects with people who have similarly suffered a tragedy. You know, when I was Secretary of State and Joe was Vice President, uh, we had a standing date for breakfast on uh, every Tuesday. And I'd go over to the Vice President's house and we'd sit down and, and we'd kind of talk about the world. We'd talk about what was going on, what the challenges facing us were, what was coming up in the White House, what the next meeting, in the Situation Room was going to be. But we also talked about our families and we talked about his love of trains and his love of ice cream, which you know knows <laughs> no bounds as far as I can tell. Uh, so I've been uh, not only a colleague of Joe Biden's, I've been a friend. And I can tell you that I wish he were president right now, but I can't wait until he is if all of us do our part. Uh, to support uh, the kind of person that we want back in the White House, uh, to end the kind of disregard of not only American values, but American institutions, the rule of law, and so much else that is at stake because of the current occupant. So I'm thrilled to be uh, here with Joe uh, from my home uh, and his home during the uh, very crazy, scary times that we uh, find ourselves in uh, to support his candidacy and to talk about this really significant issue uh, about women uh, during this time of COVID-19 and how we need to learn from what is happening you know, this crisis has stripped bare for everybody to see the inequities in our healthcare system, in our economic system. And we have to pull together uh, to be prepared to make the changes that will fix uh, what is wrong in America so that we truly can live up to be the best versions of ourselves. And I think Joe Biden can lead us there. Thanks, Joe. Oh, Hillary, thank you. We are. We are friends, uh, gosh, uh, and uh, we both have, uh, you know, that famous uh, quote by Joyce, when I die, Dublin will be written on my heart. I think when we die, Scranton will be written on our hearts. <laughs> um, and uh, it was uh, 
Um, I really, uh, I really appreciate your friendship, and well, what a, well, what a, a, just a wonderful personal endorsement. Look, um, women, as you know better than I do, are facing uh, the same issues uh, we all are facing during this pandemic. But as I said at the beginning, they're often facing them more acutely. As you point out, 80 percent of the healthcare workers are women. A lot of doctors, but a lot more nurses. Millions of women who have lost their jobs through no fault of their own. Even more have had their hours slashed, and and many women who are parents have to worry about more than losing their job. They aren't just overwhelming numbers or aggregate statistics. Everyone is a life thrown into uncertainty, and a family unable to make ends meet. You know, Congress gave President Trump the tools, uh, people on on payroll in the CARES Act, uh, what they could, how they could help, but uh, he hasn't fully used them. President Trump, in my view, should be expanding short-term compensation programs for workers. Rather than laying off people, businesses should be reducing their hours and government make up the difference in the pay. That will keep workers' paychecks whole and ensure the distressed businesses don't lose money. And we also have to do more to help most the most vulnerable families who are struggling. Uh, and, and I think we should immediately freeze rent for qualifying individuals, halt foreclosures and evictions as people get back on their feet, increase the SNAP program. This guy wanted to keep cutting SNAP. We should increase it by 15 percent during this deepening recession and temporarily provide low-income families with about $100 per month extra in nutritional support. So my question to you is, Hillary, what, what, what other things should we be talking about, thinking about, to support the millions of women who've lost their jobs and as a result of this crisis. What else? I mean, you're, you've been way ahead on these issues for a long time. What else do you think we should be talking about? Well, first, Joe, I endorse everything you said. And it really does uh, trouble me that uh, uh, the president has not been uh, willing to do everything you just listed. And in fact, his administration uh, was poised to take action that would make life harder. You know, one of the problems that I am incredibly worried about is our food supply and getting enough uh, nutritious food uh, to people. We already have uh, a problem in our country, even before this uh, pandemic, of making sure that people in every area, in parts of our cities where there are food deserts, in rural areas where there's not uh, a steady uh, supply of nutritious food, uh, the schools having to close down, uh, meaning that there was not going to be a school lunch and school breakfast program. So I really applaud everybody who has been working on that uh, and has been filling in the gaps. Uh, but our country as a whole has to make uh, a real commitment to ensuring that in this uh, time period, with the incredible economic pressures people are facing, uh, plus the problems that exist in making sure every part of the country has adequate food supply, that we're going to be there. We're going to be there for everybody, for every mom who worries about what she's going to feed her kids, uh, for every grandmother who's trying to take care of, you know, a, a, a sick or elderly spouse uh, and, and, and needs good nutrition for everybody who is out there on the front lines, either at home or outside. Uh, so food has to be at the top of the list. Secondly, as you rightly point out, uh, we know that once again, big surprise, uh, too much of the money that was in uh, these recovery acts have gone to the wrong people. They've ended up in the hands of public corporations or other well-off entities and individuals. That is just shameful. And so whatever happens going forward, we need to fix that. Money needs to get to those small businesses and into the hands of employees. And I share your uh, belief that we should have tried to keep people employed, you know, making sure that rather than being laid off or furloughed, that they could keep being paid and be on that uh, payroll so that when time does come to reopen in different parts of the country on a, on a rolling basis, they'd be ready to go. Uh, but that's not what we did. And now we know that even this latest tranche of money, um, the SBA is, you know, failing uh, at getting it into the hands of the people who need it. And a lot of 
state unemployment uh, systems are woefully behind the time. They don't have the technology. They don't have the manpower to be able to get people answers as soon as possible. And too many people are being left out of even that program. So we need to fill in the blanks. We need to streamline the process. We need to get money into people's hands. We need to make sure that nutritional needs are met. For goodness sakes, don't cut back the SNAP program, which for those watching who may not know, used to be called food stamps, but it is supplemental nutrition assistance for people. And right now we need that. And we need to make sure that everybody who uh, needs a good nutritious meal can get it. And again, I want to do a big shout out to all of the charities, all of the localities that are trying to fill that gap. But it should be uh, helped and supported by the federal government. And I, I want to say one other thing, too, which is, as you've been pointing out in your uh, in your uh, uh, podcasts and your uh, town halls and other uh, technological encounters with voters, uh, which I know must be killing you, Joe Biden, <laughs> one of the best retail politicians there is, and you're sitting in your house doing this, but, you know, that's what we've got to do. We still don't understand what the federal government is going to do to help states and localities be able to do the testing that they need, uh, the tracking that they need, and the isolating that they need to be able to safely open up in the uh, days and weeks ahead. So we've got economic problems facing us that are being, in my view, inadequately addressed by this administration. And then we have the incoherent, uh, a really impossibly uh, indifferent, insensitive approach uh, that we've seen every day on our TVs uh, from the administration when it comes to getting us back healthy so that we can actually get the economy open and get back to work again. You know, uh, Hillary, uh, it's amazing. Uh, you know, when we, uh, we used to have those uh, breakfasts once a week um, and uh, we talked about a lot of things and one of the things we did talk about is the beyond foreign policy and family and all the things we, we talked about was about how, you know, government mattered and there had to be oversight. There had to be transparency. And, um, and so uh, the interesting thing that really bothers me with this president did when they passed the CARES Act, there's a lot of good things in it. He essentially eliminated the inspector general. No, no, there's virtually no transparency. We should know exactly where every single dollar went. Even some of the big corporations who got money said, whoa, wait a minute, I didn't realize I wasn't supposed to get it. Some have given it back, 10, $15 million to get it when they're billion dollar corporations. And so you see that happening, but you know, the idea of not having transparency, knowing exactly where the money went, so people can judge whether it's consistent with what the Congress passed is a big deal. The second thing is, you saw that Chuck and Nancy, the uh, majority, the minority leader and the speaker on the Democratic side, tried very hard to get money in for state and local governments. Remember how we did that during the Recovery Act? Because what was happening? It saved the jobs of thousands and thousands of teachers, police officers, firefighters, sanitation workers, all those folks, because... As you know better than anybody, the states have to have balanced budgets. The cities have to have balanced budgets. They can't go into deficit spending. And they weren't able to get that done. And so I completely agree with you. While we need to do all we can to help women and families get through this crisis, when we get to the other side, it seems to me, and you referenced this when you first spoke, we can't just build back to where we were before. We have to build a much more inclusive much more equitable middle class and an economy that everybody, everybody gets a fair shot at. And we have to increase the minimum wage. Uh, you know, this crisis further heightened the critical workers of low income, the critical work of low income workers. I mean, you know, one job should be enough to raise a family on. And we have to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour, which you've worked for and I've worked for for a long time. And this is something we worked together for for many years. It's, but it's way past time to have equal pay for equal work, which has been one of your strongest, strongest uh, pursuits in your career. You know, our administration, we signed the first law, the Lilly <laughs> Ledbetter Fair Pay Act. We thought that was right. a big start, and it was. But I think we have to pass the Paycheck Fairness Act. We need to pay, get paid sick leave available for every worker. We've got to make sure it's not just a temporary thing. So if you get sick, 
You're not foregoing a paycheck to stay home. And we need to provide 12 weeks of paid family medical and, and medical leave so you can take care of your loved one if, you're, if they, they, they need you. And they, these are basic, basic protections that we should be providing to workers. And we've tried for a while. So much more needs to be done. Here's my point. I think you, as you implied, I think the blinders have sort of been taken off. Not that people were bad. They did not want to help. They just didn't fully understand the disadvantage. So many people who make their lives function for them, what they were, what they were going through. I don't think they had any idea what they were going through. So my next question for, for you is, it seems to me we're going to face a monumental task yeah. of rebuilding yeah. our economy and the middle class. And... How do you think, I think we're on the same page, but I, I want the, the folks to hear, how, how do you think, how would you recommend we start to, you know, take advantage of, I always say, and my staff is tired of hearing me saying it, that, you know, we're one of the few nations that when we're faced with a gigantic crisis, we embrace it, we fix it. A lot of people hurt. And they, all those lost lives are never going to come back, and there's going to be a hole in the hearts of millions of families out there. But, you know, we always come back and we come back stronger. We come back stronger and we end up in a better place than before it all happened. So what, what do you think we should be focusing on? And do you, are you as optimistic as I am we can do this? I am. And I agree with you, Joe, that I think out of this terrible tragedy of the pandemic and the loss of life and loss of income and everything we're suffering through, um, this is a moment of reckoning. Uh, that really we are challenged. Are we going to build back stronger? Are we going to build on our foundation uh, the kind of America that you and I uh, would like to see for our children and our grandchildren? And that's really what's going to be on the ballot in this election. When it all is stripped away, what kind of America are people going to be voting for? And just to echo what you uh, pointed out, number one on transparency, you know, one of the things that I tried to do in the State Department was to create uh, a visualization of where foreign aid went. Yep. Because so many people thought we were, you know, giving foreign aid in huge amounts to all kinds of weird stuff. And indeed, we could justify where it went. For example, going after uh, the AIDS crisis in Africa. Not only the right thing to do, but a smart thing, because trying to control a different kind of pandemic was good for the United States and the rest of the world. So I think that part of the uh, remedy here has to be almost radical transparency about where the money goes, because right now, you're right, there were good things in the two pieces of uh, legislation that were signed uh, into law, but there's a lot of you know, weird stuff in there that uh, people need to see and they need to understand where is the money going? Let's follow the money. And I think one of the hallmarks of your presidency can be a commitment to the kind of transparency that will hopefully begin to rebuild trust because trust is the glue that holds a democracy together. And right now we are in an age of uh, deliberate disinformation. And the reason for that uh, is to destroy trust. If you can't believe what your leaders say, if you can't believe or you're told not to believe what the press says, if you can't believe what anybody says, then you can't trust each other enough to solve the problems that we jointly face. So I am hugely supportive of increasing both transparency and accountability. And then on all of the various issues that you uh, addressed, Hopefully, the time is now. You know, we've been working for equal pay for equal work, the, you know, Paycheck Fairness Act, which I sponsored, you sponsored, voted for whenever we got a chance, but always ran into a brick wall of opposition. Well, now, all of a sudden, you know, those essential jobs that people are doing, we used to just walk by that woman uh, stocking that grocery sh shelf. We didn't pay attention to the sanitation worker that was picking up our garbage. Well, all of a sudden, you know what? Those jobs are what's keeping us going. And the Paycheck Fairness Act should be enacted. Also, paid leave. You know, we are way overdue. We are so far <laughs> behind the rest of the world. And it's shameful. You know, the idea that a lot of people before this pandemic got really full-blown 
were worried that they couldn't take time off, even if they were feeling sick or somebody in their house was sick because they would lose their job. Yep. That is that is not only disgraceful, it is so outdated. It is an anachronistic, and that has got to be fixed. There's a lot of things that will give more support, more security uh, to working families, and we need to join the rest of the developed world to make sure that uh, we actually wow. deliver on that. And, and the final point, which you also were alluding to, is we got to make government work in visible ways for people because yeah. right now um, I'm thrilled to see that, frankly, governors of both parties um, who have grabbed hold of this pandemic, made the tough decisions, shut down their economies, have been listening to the scientists, they're actually getting really high marks from across the political spectrum because they are leaders who are problem solvers. They are humble enough to know they don't possibly have all the answers, but they want to listen to the people who can help them try to find them. So that kind of leadership may be back in vogue. Uh, you know, we've gone through a period where I think some people might have forgotten that it really does matter who your mayor is, who your governor is, and yes, who your president is. So rebuilding that belief in governing as a way of delivering for people and making their lives a little easier, a little better, a little safer, a little healthier, all of that, I think now we have a chance uh, to have many more people paying attention and listening than we did before. And that's why I think you are exactly the right person at the right time uh, with your background and your values and, and your compassion to be able to make that case. Well, you're very generous. But I look, I, uh, you know, uh, there's so many things I'd like to continue to talk to you about. We're supposed to take questions <laughs> from the audience, but as usual, it's like one of our breakfasts. Um, <laughs> But, you know, look, um, one of the things that, uh, that I keep saying, and I really mean it, I think this crisis has allowed decent people who haven't focused before to realize that when the store clerk is making enough money to take care of their family, the wealthy guy down the street's better off. Everybody's better off. You know, when you have a system where the people who you rely on the most are in a position to be able to do their job and do it and live a decent life, that raises your standard. So the, 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 this notion is outmoded that somehow if, if people who are struggling get help, it's going to drain the resources from other. It's the opposite happens. The Amen. opposite happens. When you mm -hmm. raise salaries, all salaries go up. Everybody does better. And by the way, you know, corporate America is doing fine without having to worry about what's going to happen here. I mean, these guys and women, you know, we, we've, we got, we've, we've gotten kind of out of whack the way we measure things. And But everybody does better when we treat people and economically fairly and give them opportunities. Look... Um, I, I, I know I'm, I'm tempted to ask you another question, but uh, look, we, we, we have to take a few questions. Uh, and, and Michelle Kwan is going to read some questions to us that were submitted. And uh, Michelle, welcome. And thank you for all your involvement throughout this effort for both uh, Hillary and uh, before and me. So, Michelle, uh, fire away. All right. Thank you so much, Vice President Biden. Our first question comes from Tiffany in Connecticut. She asked, there are a lot of women who are in abusive relationships and are now stuck at home with their abusers. What are ways how women being abused can get help and know that they have a safe place to go? Well, thanks, uh, Michelle. And I'm so glad uh, Tiffany is asking that question. Violence against women is a huge problem, and especially right now. And Hillary and I have worked very hard on trying to end violence against women, wrote that legislation. And it's been one of the leading causes of my life. I've met thousands of domestic violence victims for real, and I'm trying to get the law passed and finally getting it passed and, and working beyond that. And it's heartbreaking to know the suffering they have experienced and are experiencing. But I also know how much courage they have. Our support 
for victims has to match the courage they show every day. First, I want victims to know they are not alone. The National Domestic Violence Hotline is there for them. It might be hard to make that call when you are essentially trapped in a home because of the stay-in order, the stay-at-home orders that exist. But you can text and you can chat online. So please reach out for help. The hotline can connect you to an emergency shelter. They can help you find a safe place to go. They can provide you to get out of the house safely. And federal and state governments need to do everything they can to help survivors at this moment in time. That means, one, providing survivors a place to live where they can stay safe and healthy. We have violence women's shelters and homes, but we have to move beyond that in this crisis. We should empower FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Organization, to work with every state so they immediately increase shelter options, including contracting with hotels and motels to provide shelter, modifications like uh, sleeping uh, in, uh, in, 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 you know, just to have the idea that we deal with trailers that are available for people as well. You know, we have to also provide immediate economic relief to survivors. No one should be forced to stay with their abuser because they don't have the resources to leave, particularly, you know, the vast majority of kids in the street are there because their moms are victims of violence. We need to provide survivors. In, and the way we provide for survivors is we include cash assistance, unemployment insurance, flexible to their needs, and paid safe days and safe leave. You know, we have to make sure all survivors, survivors of color, immigrants, survivors of Native, Native American survivors, older survivors, those with disabilities, the, LBG, the LB, LGBTQ community, survivors, they all need support. And we have to make sure survivors and services can be connected. I've worked very to make that hotline as uh, had a, a the state of the art telecommunications. When you call, they can tell where you are. They can get there in a hurry with real police protection if you need it. Now it's time to push again. We have to equip our hotlines and vital service providers and service providers with the tools that they need to take care of the person who's calling. There's a lot more to be said about this topic, and today I've released a, a proposal on how I'd address the scourge of violence against women during this public health crisis. Uh, go to JoeBiden.com, and I hope you'll look them over because there's ways out. The worst thing in the world is being a prisoner in your own home, and so many people are right now. Hillary, uh, well, Joe. Yeah, look, I, I looked at uh, the policy that you're releasing. It is state of the art. Uh, I hope everybody watching uh, goes to uh, uh, your website and starts looking and reading your policies. You've got a, an incredibly uh, progressive, detailed set of policies already on your website. Uh, but there's a relation to a point you made earlier, and that is uh, this is an issue, violence against women, domestic violence, uh, that is one of the many, many issues that depend upon state and local resources. Because as you said, uh, you call that hotline, very often uh, the hotline will refer you to uh, a shelter or if necessary, uh, police or EMT workers um, to your door. Well, those are local resources. And people who think we don't need to uh, you know, reimburse and help uh, state and local governments are just, again, missing the forest for the trees. If you believe in police protection, fire protection, EMT services, hotline shelters for domestic violence uh, survivors and everything else, you've got to know that the uh, budgets of our state and local governments uh, during this crisis have been uh, drained. And we've got to get to them some relief to be able to provide the services that not only individuals like domestic violence survivors need, but every one of us. Uh, we don't know when we need police or fire or EMT or anything that uh, we might in the future require. We know we need sanitation and, and public health and all the rest of it, all of which needs to be uh, funded adequately. So. Uh, I think uh, the work you've done, as long as I've known you, on behalf of domestic violence, uh, the violence against uh, women legislation that you wrote and you led 
I remember when we set up uh, the office in the Justice Department in the Clinton administration, uh, you know, that was part of your legislation. Uh, so this issue deserves to be um, focused on and we need to encourage people, call that hotline. Uh, don't suffer in silence, either you or your children. Seek help even now during this pandemic crisis. And then let's all resolve that we're going to do even better following the outline of the policy that you've put out to make sure that everyone in every home in America uh, can be as safe as they deserve to be. Thank you so much, Secretary Clinton. Uh, our next question comes from Hannah in Indianapolis. As the United States continues to endure the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, what would you do to make sure women, especially poor and marginalized women, have access to all women's health care services? Well, Michelle, the first thing I do, and I thank the questioner for that important question, is that uh, I would do for all workers is make sure that COVID-19 treatment, not just testing, is cost free. People, even when we had the test, which we don't sufficiently, people who have access are worried to go get the test because they're going to be charged. They believe that. So it has to be cost free and a treatment cost free. No one should have to pay a dollar out of pocket for that. Now, I've called for that on March the 12th, and it should be part of the next congressional package, I hope. The next thing I would do is help laid off workers to uh, ensure they can keep their health insurance through COBRA, meaning that if their health insurance is provided by their company, which they pay into, it's really expensive for most families to make up the difference. There's a thing called COBRA. You can keep that insurance. If the company can no longer pay their share, you make up the difference. Well, there have been multiple times more than the existing premium that you should have to pay because your employer is no longer making contributions toward that premium. And so I think the government should make up that difference for people now. And uh, this is a crisis. And Trump and the Congress should pick up the full cost of the COBRA premiums that have to be made up right now, in my view. And if you don't have employer sponsor insurance, we should immediately reopen what's called the open enrollment so that you can sign up for coverage and create an affordable public option that we can do through the Affordable Care Act, which the president is still trying to eliminate right as we speak. And finally, we need to ensure that women have access to all health services during this crisis. Abortion is an essential health care service. It's being used as a political wedge right now, and it shouldn't be. The American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists and the American Medical Association agree that it shouldn't be categorized as a procedure that can be delayed. It can't. And in this case, health care delayed means health care denied. States should not be using public health crisis to infringe on a women's constitutional right. There's more to say, but I, I, I know I'm going too long in these answers. Hillary, the floor is yours. Well, look, I, I think you're, you're going right down uh, the path that uh, people need to follow you on, because as you rightly point out, uh, this is another opportunity, I hope for the American people to see why those of us who support universal health care uh, have been doing so for so many years. Uh, there should not be any question at any time, but particularly at the height of a pandemic, that people will have the health care that they deserve because of cost or availability. So I'm hoping, Joe, that as you have proposed, you know, we try to fill all those gaps, uh, a public option uh, going as far as we possibly can, lowering the age of Medicare, going as far uh, as we possibly can, making sure that uh, everybody has access to quality, affordable health care. And, and now we know why. I mean, you know, you you can't hide from a virus. Uh, we can try to, you know, stay inside and hope that uh, we don't come in contact with anyone who's carrying it. Although, with so many people being asymptomatic, uh, it's a little hard to know, uh, even uh, in your daily life, going to the store or the pharmacy, whether you might encounter somebody, which is why we should keep, uh, you know, wearing masks and washing our hands and everything else we're told to do. But why add to that existing anxiety, the panic, the fear that if you get sick, you won't be able to afford health care? Yeah. That is wrong. That is fundamentally wrong. It is against 
our moral values, every religious value that I'm aware of. And yet, you're 100% right that this administration, this White House, as we speak, are still trying to strip the Affordable Care Act. Now, and let's remember one other thing, and I don't think this has gotten enough attention. Um, President Trump is on the record from his uh, trip to Davos in the Swiss Alps of saying that uh, it was time to go after Social Security and Medicare. <laughs> so, you know, th th this is a high stakes time uh, because of the pandemic, but this is also a really high stakes election. And every form of health care should continue to be available, including uh, reproductive health care for every woman uh, in this country. Uh, and then it needs to be part of a much larger system that eventually and quickly, I hope, gets us to universal health care. So uh, I, I can uh, only uh, say amen to everything you're saying, but also to, again, enlist people that this would be a terrible crisis to waste, as the old saying goes. We've mm -hmm. learned a lot about what our absolute uh, frailties are in our country when it comes to health justice and economic justice. So, you know, let's be resolved that we're going to solve those once you're elected president. I promise you that's going to be my objective. Thank you so much, Secretary Clinton and Vice President Biden. Our last question comes from Asha, a pharmacist from New Jersey. Asha is an essential worker during this crisis and wonders what you do as president to ensure she can do her job safely. Asha, you're one of the people we've been talking about the whole time here, an essential worker. You know, what you're doing is important all the time, but particularly right now to provide one, essential workers with all they need for personal protective equipment that you need to do your job safely. I urge the president to use the full authority of what they call the Defense Production Act well over a month ago not only the surge production of critical protective gear and tests and, and more, but also to ensure that they're distributed swiftly and in full so that everybody has it. And that means you. And I've also urged the president to appoint what Hillary would have long ago done, a supply commander, someone who, like in the military, has control of all the supplies in the middle of a war knows where they have to go, controls them, and with broad authority and deep logistical experience to step up and actually command our national supply chain for the critical equipment that you need but others need, working with governors to get all frontline workers the life-saving protection and the equipment they need. And also, all workers like yourself who are putting their lives on the line should receive, in my view, premium pay. Now, premium pay is no substitute for personal protective equipment. It's not. And it's not a substitute for worker safety, but we have to do as much as we can to support the millions of brave workers like you who stayed on the job, keeping the country running. I support what's called in the, that, the, that the Democrats are pushing in the Congress, pandemic premium pay. Increase essential frontline workers that, that the, both the Senate and the House have proposed that, in fact, gives you more income. We need to make sure that if you, God forbid, get sick, you get paid time off as well. We need to make paid sick leave available to every worker and make sure it's not just a temporary thing. If you get sick, you're not for going a paycheck to stay home. Now, look, if you get sick, you should have to go. You, you shouldn't have to go to work because you're worried about a paycheck especially now when we're worried about the spread of this dangerous disease. It's critical that essential workers can stay home when they get sick and don't spread the disease. And we need to provide 12 weeks of paid family medical and medical leave so you can take care of your loved ones. And look, folks, the whole idea here that's become clear, in my view, if you excuse the, the, uh, the addendum here, you know, when the president went to Davos and talked about and I remember when I was making this case as vice president saying that the Republicans are going to try to cut Medicare and Social Security. He said, ah, oh, no, they're not going to do that. That's been their objective. God love Paul Ryan. He set out to do that. And the president hadn't given up on that cause. And the cause is what we should be doing right now is a lot of our senior workers who are, who are very old, need an additional, an additional amount of Social Security now during this crisis. 
We should be increasing their Social Security payment while this crisis moves forward, while we reform the whole Social Security system to provide for the ability of people who have had their pay cut, their Social Security payment cut because their spouse has passed, because they, for a whole lot of reasons it happens. We should make sure that they, in fact, are able to get more, not less. And we can do that by changing the way we fund Social Security. I won't go into the whole deal. But in the meantime, right away, we should be giving help right now, an extra thousand bucks to people who, in fact, are on Social Security that, in fact, are struggling on the limited amount they're getting if they're at the low end of that scale. But at any rate, there's a lot more to talk about. I'm sorry. As I said, this is like one of our breakfasts. Either Hillary's person will be coming in saying, Madam Secretary, or my guy will be coming in saying, no, Mr. Vice President, the president's waiting. So we, And usually when we walk in late, we walk in late to a national security meeting with the president, and he'd look at both of us like, where in the hell have you been? At any rate, but uh, uh, thanks, Hillary, good. for everything. I really appreciate it. And uh, and I, but I really, uh, anyway, I, I know... You, you, you're going to answer that question as well, but thank you. Oh, listen, a uh, lot of good memories. Uh, you're absolutely right. You know, and, and when you mentioned Social Security, uh, I have long advocated, and I know you agree, that we need to fix uh, the disadvantage that women uh, unfortunately yes. bear under Social Security. Because when you take time out to care for children or a, an ailing spouse or ailing parents, uh, you're out of the workforce and you don't get the credit that you need uh, to be able uh, to have a more secure retirement when uh, that becomes uh, possible. So the Social Security system, Medicare, they, they should not be in the uh, bullseye uh, target of this president and all of his uh, plutocratic allies. Uh, they need to be uh, helped to be strengthened and improved so that they actually do provide uh, the quality of care that they uh, should be and the amount of income that they should be uh, offering. And, and on a final note, Joe, I, I would just say to Asha, who is on the front lines, and thank you so much because clearly we can't get through this without you and the millions of others who are doing what you're doing. Um, this election really is uh, a referendum on what kind of future we want uh, for you and for all of the people in our country, but particularly uh, those frontline workers, uh, those folks who have uh, been uh, really put under enormous economic pressure, the many millions that are now applying for unemployment. We got to fix our systems, friends. I mean, we've kind of just, um, you know, moved along on top of them, trying to protect what we had against the concerted, relentless effort by too many on the other side to rip away what we did have. But now if we get people to pay attention and to really look at what's at stake for them, for their families, uh, then I think we can have an election uh, that really will matter about how we put us on a stronger foundation for the future. And I'm thrilled uh, to be here with Joe today. Uh, it is a little bit, as you've got a, a kind of a front view into uh, our, our breakfast at the vice president's house uh, those years ago, every Tuesday morning. Uh, but more than that, uh, what Joe's trying to do, what his candidacy is about, what his campaign stands for, is a much better, safer, healthier, stronger future uh, for every single American uh, today and uh, those who come after us. So, Joe, thank you. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for your friendship. Uh, and uh, this was a lot of fun. I appreciate the chance to, you know, join you uh, virtually in your basement to talk about issues that really matter to us and to millions and millions of other Americans. Well, I have to tell you something completely honestly, straightforward. I wish this were us doing this and my supporting your reelection. For president of the United States. You won the majority of the vote. I think the uh, the way in which uh, some of the states acted was just, anyway, I, I we would not, uh, we, we'd have problems, we'd have the pandemic, but you would have already been prepared for it. Still would have been hard, but you would have done a lot uh, to keep us from getting so in such a dire strait. Well, Why I'll tell we... you one thing I would have done, Joe, which you know so well, 
I would have read my daily intelligence briefings <laughs> <laughs> that were sounding the alarm since January, oh, but apparently this president doesn't uh, do what we used to do. <laughs> you know, I was just, I did the, uh, uh, the foreign policy brief this morning, which I do every morning with people who you know really well. Uh, former Secretary uh, Blinken, Tony Blinken, and uh, you know a, a whole bunch of folks. You know Tom Donlan, a whole range of people who were, um, and um, they uh, were reading to me. We were talking about the uh, uh, what happened uh, that article in the in the Washington Post and the yesterday, and how many times, how many times, the president was explicitly by his national security team, warned of this pandemic, warned about it, saying what had to be done. I think it was close to like eight or nine specific times, resulting in some of those folks uh, in the intelligence community either being fired or just going underground. I mean, not being paid attention to it at all. I mean, you and I have had, and you even more than me as the Secretary of State, I sat every single day with the president and got a national security briefing. And when you weren't traveling the world, you were at every one of those. And the idea that we would have been warned more than a half a dozen times explicitly by the intelligence committee of what was coming, what had happened, what China wasn't doing, et cetera, and then be out there complimenting what a great job China was doing. What, I mean, I, I, it's just beyond, and I assume, I, I shouldn't assume anything, but my guess is you would have read, oh, that's what you're talking about. The question is, did he just not read his but they we used to call the PDB, or did he read it? And not care. I, 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 I presume to give the more generous view that he just didn't read it, which is a totally ungenerous view. I mean, but I can't fathom it. And look what it's done to the intelligence community, and its sense of whether or not it brings bad news to a president. Anyway, that's a whole other subject. Maybe we should talk about one day. But look, I want to thank you. everybody. I want to thank. Hillary, for joining us in this conversation today. And Hillary, I'm going to keep calling and asking for your advice. Uh, the coronavirus is shining a bright light on the equities in our country, and there's so much work to do. But I have no doubt we can meet these challenges brought on by this virus if we work together. The American people have never, not a joke, I know I'm here tired of hearing me say this, have never, ever, ever, ever let the country down, given half a chance. They're tough. There's no quit in America. They're prepared, but we got to do it together. And uh, it's great being together with you, Hillary. Thank you. And Michelle, thank you so very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, everyone, for being in and listening.